In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a cradle Catholic who was born and raised in Cameroon, Africa. After moving to the U.S., this man drifted away from the church. While working at a gas station convenience store during his university years, our lapsed Catholic met a holy priest who helped him home to the Catholic faith and a priestly vocation. Like everyone else in this series, today's guest came home to the church by responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Father Henry Atem. Father Henry, welcome to our home. Thank you. Welcome to the show, and thank you for your holy priesthood. Thank you. Appreciate it. I love hearing about people's youth, where they grew up, what their faith was like. So tell us about your young days. Well, I was born and raised in a, a small city in Cameroon called uh, Boya. And for those viewers who don't know, Cameroon, Cameroon is in is West Africa. West Central Africa, okay. type of, yeah, next to Nigeria. Yes. So that's where I was born, uh, one of five children. Uh, my dad was a university professor. My oh. mom was a school teacher. And so grew up in a, in a neighborhood with a lot of kids. So grew up in an environment where community was such a big thing for us. Sure. And it kind of defined a lot of who we were and what we did. Part so of the culture. It's part of the culture, and that's right. Were, was your family Catholic and were most of the families around you Catholic? Uh, pretty much. I think most of the families around us were Catholic. Cameroon is about 40% Catholic. And what so, other faiths are popular in Cameroon? A third of the population is Muslim uh -huh. uh, to the north. And then there's also Protestants, like Presbyterians and Baptists and all the other uh, uh, Protestant denominations. But my family was Catholic, born and raised Catholic, come from a very uh, proud tradition of Catholics. Yes. And so the faith, especially through my parents, meant something uh, serious and important for us growing up as a little what boy. What do you remember most that your parents imparted upon you about the faith, the family tradition, a devotion, a particular saint, anything in particular you remember from your childhood? Well, my, I think for my mom, it was a sense of devotion. So my mom was very uh, devoted to the faith. I mean, yes. you know, she was a daily mass go and, and oh. things like that. For my dad, it was more from an intellectual point of view. Yes. My dad saw Catholicism as being necessary in life because he thought it gave structure to life. Yes. So for him, it was very important. He, he looked at all the things that the Catholic Church had done in the world. And so for him, that was a big thing. So he encouraged us to always value the contribution that the church has made. And that was one of the motivations why he stayed Catholic, why he always appreciated and loved Catholicism. You know what I think is really cool about your parents? It, it, you had faith and reason in the exactly. same household. Absolutely, absolutely. That, I, could, I could actually say that. I yeah, could what a good that. foundation. Yeah. So that was your foundation and you stayed in Cameroon and your life as a Catholic went deeper and that was the end of the story. Well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> we know. No, I mean, as the growing, up, growing up as a little boy, I went to Catholic school, yeah. through middle uh, grade school, uh, everything in high school, mm -hmm. and pretty Catholic, very involved in church, altar service. I belonged to a few of the um, different ministries in my local parish growing up as a little boy. When I finished high school, my family relocated to, to Georgia. Okay. Uh, we came to America, and that was where I think things kind of changed a little bit. A little culture uh, shock coming culture to America. Shock. Was it more secular here than you remembered in Cameroon? It was. It was more secular. Uh, well, secular in the sense that 
it wasn't as community oriented. Yeah. As Big city was, versus yeah, a exactly, small community. Exactly. So I was kind of used to a small community where every in the community, everybody was connected to you everyone. You had accountability. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're right. here. You yeah, can do exactly. what you want, and people may not even know it. Back at home, that's exactly mm -hmm. was. It was like we're all brothers and sisters. It was like a whole big community, sure. the whole neighborhood. We all felt like we were one big family. When it was here, it was more individualistic. I mean, everybody had their own little lane that were that were walking in, and and so it was hard for me. It was such a a difference yes. to kind of realign myself to that new way of of defining culture. So, did you eventually stop going to mass? Well, I did. Uh, when we moved, uh, my family lived in Gainesville, Gainesville, Georgia. And I pretty much just, part of it was the culture difference. I think it was so hard getting, uh, understanding the mass, the way mass was celebrated in Cameroon. It was such a celebration. I mean, you know, festive. mass in Cameroon. Yeah, very festive. It goes on for a couple of hours. There's singing and there's dancing. So a shorter mass here wasn't more appealing <laughs> to you? Like, I don't get it. I could see know, kids right? going there That's saying, right. hey, it's three they're, hours. They're what long, gives? Right? But yeah. No, in Cameroon. You're the first guy who's ever left because mass was too <laughs> short. So too <laughs> good point. Good yeah. point. But no, I think uh, uh, mass wasn't as festive as it was back yeah. at home in Cameroon. So, so you were kind of bored. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of like, okay. And you weren't engaged. I wasn't engaged. Yeah. I didn't understand the culture very much. So even homilies were hard for me to understand because I did not understand the references that were made during the homilies and things like that. So I went to church maybe a few months when we came and I just stopped going. The other part of it too was just money. I, I started yeah. chasing money. I mean, I was all about, so in college, about the dollar. Yeah. In college, started chasing so, money, chasing working. Money, girlfriend working. in college? Had a girlfriend in college. Uh, we did it for my for three and a half years of college. So, so up to this time, you were you were working, yeah. and something changed where you met this priest. Yeah. While you were working at a gas station. At a gas station. At a gas That's station right. convenience store. Convenience store. And yeah. everything changed at that point in your life. Everything changed. Everything changed. It was uh, it was quite dramatic. Coming up, you'll see what happens next in Father Henry's journey of faith. I started thinking about the fact that, you know, there had to be more to life than just going to school and going to work. There is a soul, and that soul also is in need of our attention. Should I try to use my mind to figure everything out, or should I simply rely on faith to understand? See, those who rely on faith alone to view the world are not using their minds to reason and those who only rely on reason to interpret reality are turning their backs on the gift of faith. Well, the perfect solution involves a marriage of both faith and reason. See, God knew that we would be full of questions, big questions, as large as our universe. And God created us with intellects to wonder, dream, and philosophize. Yet God asks us to believe in some truths that we can't see with our eyes. We can arrive at perfect truth when we choose to see with the eyes of faith while we reason with our minds. And our faith can truly blossom when we explore it with our mind. Maybe St. Augustine said it best. I believe in order to understand, and I understand in order to believe. So Father Henry, you're a Georgia Bulldog. You've got a girlfriend for three, three and a half years in college. You're making money working at the gas station convenience store, finishing up your schooling. Life is good. You're not going to mass. You're living the American secular life. And a priest walks into your gas station and your life changes. Absolutely. What happened? Life did change. Okay, so uh, Father Larry Nice, uh -huh. uh, his name, uh, he came into the store and he was going to purchase coffee, uh, milk, and things. and. And he came and he put the stuff on the, uh, on the counter and I was standing behind the, the counter and I was the store manager. Uh -huh. And so he forgot his bill folder back in the rectory. Oh, so he forgot the bill folder. Bill folder. <laughs> That's right. That's what I keep telling him every yeah, time. I yeah. say, yeah, you forgot the bill folder, right? He did that when I went to <laughs> breakfast with him last time. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, He's no, a really okay, good okay. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, so he came back and he said, well, he apologized. He said he has to go back to the rectory to get, get money and that he will not be able to pay for his stuff. And, just walked in with a you know kind of little pocket of change, sure. you know, and I said, yeah, whatever, you know. But uh, but I decided to take care of the stuff for him. That's nice. Uh, yeah, so walked outside with him to the car, and, and he he said, you look like a very nice young man. When he gave me his card, so why don't you call me? And I said, well, you know, uh, 
not been to church for a long time. I don't know if he wants to talk to me now, you know, what was this all about? But anyway, and I didn't make much of it. So I didn't think about it, never called them uh, for a few months until I had a priest friend visiting me from, uh, from Europe. He came to visit and because the priest said he, he wanted to celebrate Mass. Ah. So called Father Larry, he was so gracious to this priest. And, and he remembered and you? He remembered me and he and the guy came and the guy was able to celebrate Mass at the parish. Nice. And then the guy left and, and a few months went by and I finally just said, you know, let me call him and talk to him. Let me yeah. just, you know, have a What, what was inside of your heart or mind at the time that prompted you to do that? Well, you know, I think I was getting to a point where college was wrapping up very soon and I was almost midway through senior year and, and I was thinking to myself, you know, okay, so after I graduate from college, is this going to be it? I mean, yeah, I, okay. Yeah, there's got to be more to life exactly. than this. Exactly. It's like, yeah. you know, I didn't go to church and it was like, uh, am I going to just get a nine to five job and just go to work, go to home, go, mm. go to work, go home and, and was that, was that going to be it? So I said, well, let me call him and just go have a chat with him, right. you know. So I called the office, made an appointment, went in and we had a little chat. And I think this is what was most interesting about the story. The fact that when I went over to talk to him, there was never a time he talked to me about becoming a priest or about have you ever considered going to seminary, never came up. He wasn't selling you on anything. He didn't sell anything. Well, he sold something. He sold Jesus. Amen. That was all he sold. Praise God. I just he got this Holy Spirit he sold, he sold Jesus because <laughs> he kept telling me. And he used himself as an example. Yeah. He said, you know, uh, people look at you as a priest and they... And they look at the sacrifice you make and they think that you, you, you've given up so much. And, it, and somehow a lot of people think that you get so little for all the sacrifice that you've given. But he told me, he said, Henry, the much, I get so much out of doing what I do. And he that, talked about the adventures with God absolutely. Where, where you can't absolutely. outgive God. And he was doing it not to convince you to be a priest, but talking about faith. When about you faith. say yes to God on faith, he rewards you with so much with so more much, than what so we put in. More. And that was precisely the path he took me down because he even uh, when we had conversations and we had a whole lot of conversations, sure. you know, like he knew you were an intellectual and uh, he could talk to you that. Yeah, way. he introduced me to a whole lot of books. He said, you know, you need to read some of these Catholic guys. You need to read some of these guys who will expand your way of thinking. Yeah. And so and you he were open to me. that. I was very open to it. Yeah. I mean, I read a lot of Peter Crift. Oh yeah, Peter uh, Crift is yeah, Dr. Peter Crift yeah. is a genius. He's exactly. A blessing to our lot, church. I read a lot of his works. He introduced me to some philosophical stuff. I read a lot of that and, wow. and it made me think. You know, I started thinking about the fact that, you know, there had to be more to life than just going to school and going to work. Yes. Uh, there is a soul and that soul also is in need of our attention. Amen. You know, so that brought me back and he said, you know, when you get a chance, come by the church. They had Eucharistic Adoration on Tuesday evenings. He invited me to that. And so you started me. going. It started he becoming said, a, a yes, good habit. Exactly. And you suddenly so found yourself at home. I found myself just going to adoration. And, and again, I was taken, uh, taken aback by the sense of reverence and the yes. sense of awe, which was, was there in adoration. And you remember those things remember. from when you were a child. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. From my childhood as a, as a, as a Catholic boy. So That's when did the transition happen, Father Henry, from coming back to regular practice of Mass and then discerning priesthood? priesthood. That's a pretty big leap. Well, so... And how uh, did your girlfriend feel about uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother story. <laughs> but, um, but when I came back and I started going to adoration, that was the first thing. So he invited me back to adoration and I started doing adoration. And then I found out that, yeah, I think I need to start going back to Mass. And the first couple of times I went to Mass, it was one of those, you know, got there like right after the readings and stayed there oh, for a late. little bit yeah you were a catholic came late left Kept, early left mm -hmm. early yeah. pretty much and you know i came in and a short while afterwards and i just said well like right after communion and i did not receive communion because i know i was falling so well, far well, off well good so, for you yeah good for you, so you didn't receive receive communion, worthily, yeah but i just came there and it was like and i left and you know it's like for a lot of people when you fall off the faith to come back into uh, faithful practice, it, it takes a little while, you know. Were you one of those people who said, um, I'm not sure the church wants me back, I'm not sure God can forgive me, or was your issue something different? No, it was different because I never felt as if uh, being away from the church, I, I never felt any kind of guilt. Ah. Yeah, it was just like I didn't go to church, but um, I, didn't, I never felt like I did something wrong not going to church, you know. That was the sad part about it. Yeah. So it was only when I started coming back and becoming a little bit more active. And I remember one time I came to church on a Sunday and Father Larry gave me a, a cassock and a surplice and he said, you're going to serve Mass today. 
Oh, wow. And I was like, well, I have no idea, you know, but he said, never mind, you, you know, they'll, they'll show you exactly what to do. And so... He's I was, bold. I like yeah, his I'm style. You, St. Yeah. Paul, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that because of that, I was able to get in there all to surf and that kind of made me feel more part of the community. I'm part of the church again. And, and even as a priest, I try to do a lot of that. People need to be involved in some tangible yes, way, yes. you know, yeah. But God bless Father Larry for listening to the Holy Spirit, not only to invite you and engage you, to not forget you, uh, and then to encourage you and invite you to adoration, to give you intellectual books. And now he's going, here's a cast that comes serve Matt. That's, that's bold, but he, the Holy Spirit was giving him the nudge and he wasn't embarrassed or wasn't shy about going with that nudge from absolutely, the Holy Spirit. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, he planted all those seeds, I think in the right way, at yep. the right time. Never any pressure, it was always just very inviting. Yeah. Um, and I think, as I said, at no point throughout the whole journey did he ever talk about the priesthood. It was one day I came and I sat with him and I said, you know, maybe I, I think maybe I, I'll try to become a priest. I think ah. God is calling me to this. That's awesome. And he said, well, I think God is calling you too. I've seen those signs, mm. but he never said anything about it. And so he said, well, I'll put you in touch with Father Brian Higgins, who was vocations yes. director at the time. Excellent priest. And, you know, we had a conversation and he said, okay, um, we're going to get you started with the uh, application process. You talked about my girlfriend. It was such a heartbreak for her, I mean, which is kind of expected. Well, we can't um, blame her. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> exactly. I, you're, you're a good catch, Father. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But, um, yeah, but it was a struggle, but I had to tell her. I mean, she even saw signs because I started watching EWTN a lot uh, in yeah, Athens. Yeah. In, uh, you, uh, the it's University. kind of a weird thing to do with your date, right? <laughs> right. I think it's a great thing let's, to do with your date, don't get me wrong, but for a guy who just Let's watch back. Catholic TV, right? Yeah, and she a, wasn't even Catholic, yeah, she was praise, Protestant, yeah, so. Praise God for that. But yeah, but I started watching EWTN a lot, and at the time, uh, Pope John Paul II was making a lot of, a lot of trips around the world. Sure. And so I, it was kind of warming my heart a lot coming back to the faith and, and all of that. But Was your mom praying for you and your dad all this time? Like, was she doing the, you know, St. Monica routine for you? Or did she just know you'd I come think back she someday? Did. I think she yeah. did because I think my mom has always been faithful. And I think um, uh, she recognized that it was so unusual for someone like me because even back at home in Cameroon, the, the school I went to was, uh, um, it's a very, it's a Catholic school where a lot of guys who left from the Catholic school went to the priesthood. Yeah. So, so she never lost hope. So she in never you. lost hope. She just hope. knew it was a, yeah, a timing hope. thing, and she Abs trusted God absolutely. to bring you home absolutely. in your time and in His. And His, that's right. So where did you go to seminary, and tell us about that and how it was to celebrate your first mass? Well, seminary was great. I went up to Mount Saint Mary's. I'm oh, in excellent. Maryland. Yeah, excellent yeah. seminary. Was, Good uh, holy priest come out of there. Yeah. It was beautiful. It's a beautiful yeah. experience. I had yes. a wonderful time had a good set of brothers over there. There was, there was such a good balance between intellectual and human formation and spiritual formation, which pretty much is what we needed. Then I was ordained a priest on May 31st, 2008 by Archbishop Gregory. And I celebrated my first mass up in Gainesville, at St. Michael's up in Gainesville. And it was a beautiful experience. I had about a thousand people there for the mass, partly because a lot of people from the Cameroon community. That's awesome. Yeah, because they had never, had an experience of a Cameroon young guy getting ordained before. Especially here know, in the States, in the, too, yeah. Area, yeah. That's neat. Yeah, Where Atlanta, they were in so. their traditional uh, well, the traditional oh, I love that. and things like that. So fantastic. it was quite the celebration. A lot That's of fantastic. people there, and it was beautiful. I mean, and just such a joy-filled, uh, joy-filled moment. Soon, you'll find out what's new in Father Henry's life and vocation today. But I think the heartbeat of our parish as a pastor, but also a parish life, is Eucharistic adoration. All my life, I was searching for something that seemed to be just one step away. Perfect soulmate, the ideal job, that big adventure. And just when I thought I found what I was missing, I realized that I was never really fulfilled. Then I discovered what I was searching for was really faith in God and belonging to a church you can find what you've been searching for too. Come and see at catholicscomehome.com. Father Henry, your mama never stopped praying for you. God never gave up on you. Father Larry had the boldness to gently and lovingly invite you home. And I thank God 
All three were doing that. Absolutely. And you accepted that invitation and became a holy priest. And we thank God for that. And we thank, thank you, you for that. Thank Tell you. me now, how is the priesthood? What's parish life like as a pastor at St. George in Noonan, Georgia? Tell us more about your life as a pastor there now. Well, I could not be any more blessed to be a pastor at St. George. I, I work with a community that truly loves me, respects me, supports me. And we have a lot of projects going on in the parish. This year, we are preparing to celebrate 50th anniversary of the dedication 50th of the church. 50th anniversary, 50th. that's fantastic. 50th. Wow. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, all the plans in place to celebrate that. Um, we are also building a new rectory for the parish. Good. Um, the current rectory has some issues, so the parish has decided to build a new one. So we're oh, carrying fantastic. out that project. You got but your hands full. <laughs> got your hands full, a lot of work going on. Um, but I think the heartbeat of our parish, as a pastor, but also a parish life, is Eucharistic adoration. I think that is one thing which I've introduced in the parish, and I feel like the, the community has really embraced it. They have really uh, taken ownership of it, and that has really brought a lot more life and uh, you know a lot more uh, joy uh, yes. to the parish. And, yeah. and obviously, I know you're a fan of uh, St. Bosco, St. John Bos Don Bosco, uh, a fan of... Uh, uh, Chatard's book, Soul of the Apostolate, which all uh, shows the, the fruit that comes from a parish and a diocese that Absolutely. has perpetual adoration. Yes. And you've seen it in your community. And your uh, community is somewhat diverse, isn't it? Is it? You've got different yeah. languages and you celebrate Mass in Spanish English and teach in Spanish. In Spanish and, yes. and you also yes. speak French, right? French, that's right. Uh, um, yeah. uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, you've got an international house of prayer going on there, <laughs> that's so that's right. a good thing. What other things do you promote in the parish? What other devotions are, are big in your parish that you feel strongly about? Okay, well, we recently started uh, Divine Mercy Hour. Mm -hmm. So every Friday at three o'clock, I really, it's, uh, it's, it's not very big at this point, but I think that there's a, a sense of devotion and consistency in, the, in that devotion that yes. I think is really, is really helping the parish. Um, we're also doing, on a weekly basis, different, there's different things. At one point, we do like a Marian consecration nice. and different things like that. So, yeah. You've had so, a devotion to St. Philomena over the I've, years, too, I've, haven't you? I've had a devotion to St. Philomena. Yes. She has been my patroness since when I was about 13 years old, and she continues to journey with me, even now into my priesthood. One of our yeah. granddaughters, uh, Hannah, has Philomena as her middle name, and oh. I remember that about you, oh, that beautiful. you had a de uh, big devotion to, yes, to St. Philomena, I so do. we have to give her I credit do. where it's due. <laughs> That's right. Father, we have uh, just a few short minutes left. What would you tell people who are struggling with the scandals in the church and that? And I wanted to bring you on because good holy priests need to be put in front of the public. We need to yeah. see that we've got some real apostles in our midst who are carrying on that tradition that Jesus set. And there are a few Judases who aren't uh, doing anything, a few others that we just need to pray for. But what would you tell people who are struggling, seeing the nightly news and this, uh, about yeah. staying, staying there and, staying, and there. staying close to Jesus at yeah. this point? I mean, I think there's, uh, there's a couple of things. And there's a lot of things that we could talk about and different ways that all of this could be perceived. And first of all, you know, as, as a priest of the church, the first thing you say is you feel sorry for all the victims. Yeah something like this should never have happened to anyone, let alone coming from the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, but you know, in the end, we look at all the other people who are making an effort to be faithful. Right. And uh, we all do recognize that the one thing that builds up the church, you know, when we profess the faith, we say the church is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Yes. And those four marks remind us of the very meaning of our identity as Catholics and that uh, the church is built on the Holy Eucharist. The church is not built on my faith or on the faith of any other priest or any other person. It is built on Jesus Christ himself. And what he taught. And what he taught us. Yeah. And that, you know, um, as bad and as scandalous as the times we are going through right now could be, uh, we always have to look at the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. That face that was bruised on the cross for our salvation which uh, the face that was standing there symbolizing the sins of, of the whole world, mm -hmm. that he is the one calling us to be faithful. It is not a priest who did that or a priest who did not do what. Right. But it's Jesus Christ ultimately that, that, you know, where everything has to go back to. Father, that is yes. sound advice and a great way to end our show. I can't thank you enough. I thank uh, God for Father Larry inviting you back. I, I thank God for your priesthood. Uh, your friendship and serving not only your community, but the whole archdiocese. 
Father, welcome home. Thank you. I appreciate that. Such a great feeling to be back home. In 1622, on his deathbed and unable to speak, St. Francis de Sales was given a piece of paper and a pen and asked by the religious sisters who tended to his bedside what virtue he most wished them to cultivate. He wrote one word in large letters, humility. Here are five habits of the humble. First, you recognize your littleness. St. Therese of Lisieux was an expert at this. She knew how small she was in relation to God and embracing her own weakness and littleness, believed that she had the power to become a great saint because God loves to work with little humble souls. Second, you rely on God's mercy. Just like he did with little Therese, the Lord wants to lift all little souls to the heights of heaven. No weakness of yours is too great for his mercy. Trust that, rely on it. Third, you work to squash your pride. When you are tempted to pride, deliberately practice humility instead. Let me give you some examples. First, when you're tempted to think highly of yourself for something you've accomplished or some talent you possess, thank God instead. When you're arguing with your spouse and don't want to give in, practice self-forgetfulness and focus instead on loving your spouse instead of being right. When you want to criticize others, refrain from the criticism and perhaps even encourage or compliment instead. Fourth, you don't take yourself too seriously. Deacon Douglas McManaman writes, the proud take themselves very seriously, but among saintly people, there really is a great deal of laughter. Fifth, you pray for humility. It's hard to accomplish great things without prayer. Get on your knees and petition God to help you become a humble soul. Pray with scripture too, allowing God's supreme example of humility, becoming man and dying on a cross for our sins, to sink deep into your bones and set your heart on fire with a Christ-like humility, and also a Marian humility that says to God, be it done unto me according to your word. Here's your chance to get active in the new evangelization. Visit the CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can order a Catholics Come Home book, evangelization cards, a DVD of the Evangelmercials, or a car magnet. If you or someone you know has come home to the church thanks in part to Catholics Come Home, let us know. Or if you have a comment, question, or want to support our mission, email us at info at catholicscomehome.org or write to us at Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia, 30077. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. During his youth, Henry Atem was part of a vibrant Catholic family and community in Cameroon, Africa. But after moving to the U.S. and attending university, he drifted from his Catholic roots. Thanks to a holy priest, Henry not only returned to the church, but pursued a priestly calling himself. Now, he's a vibrant and holy Catholic priest and pastor, bringing countless souls closer to Christ. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Father Henry and his parish in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization and help love somebody to heaven. I've got love.